Today, I'm gonna to be showing you guys how I recreated Where Do We Go Now by Gracie Abrams. We're gonna go over these weird indie pop synth choices, some fun sound design stuff for our drums, and how to approach a sort of minimalist indie pop production. But before we jump into all that, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Seth. I produce music under the name Velvet Year. I do one of these videos every Friday to show people how to produce their own pop music at home. Songs I've either written or produced have been featured on these Spotify curated playlists, and I did an entire album through Warner Music Group. So if you enjoy watching me explain stuff in these videos and you think we would have fun working on a project together, check out the top link in my description. Now to the actual instrumental. So let's start with the synth that I think is the most recognizable element of the song. I used a very basic Juno patch to get this sort of like almost chiptune video game sound. I feel like this sound is kind of a statement in terms of the vibe of the song. It feels like a very unapologetic sound choice. It's not drenched out in reverb. It's not disguised behind anything. It's very in your face. But even though it might sound a little strange soloed by itself, it's really responsible for that strong eighth note downbeat for the rest of the song because everything else kind of fills in the sort of whole note or half note or quarter note spaces around this. Along with that, we have the chords. They're almost as basic of a synth patch as you can get. For these guys, I used another Juno patch inside of Analog Lab from Arturia. I want to explain to you how I came to this sort of three-part arrangement. Basically, we have a high part and a low part. And then for that higher part, we also have it doubled an octave below. So this top one here sounds like this. Below that, we have the same chords, just an octave below. I try to blend them in underneath so that you can't actually hear that these guys are also there. It just kind of sounds like one patch that's really thick. And then underneath that, we have the same patch, but it's actually playing some lower chords, a root and a fifth normally. And when we put them all together, It's just very calm and cold. They make this very warm bed of chords that also has this like robotic feel to it. But the rest of the song is pretty organic feeling. So it kind of makes up for that. And then for synths, we also have a couple of pads going here. Just a couple instances of the particles line from Outputs Arcade. I actually added these pads last when I was making this instrumental. I just wanted it to have a little bit of that sort of analog fuzz on top of the rest of the track. And so I have this one here that's that's kind of this static pad peaking here in like the 400 to 500 range. And then we have this one here that's a little bit lower than that. They're very subtle in the mix, but I just want them to sort of like tickle your ears on the side and sort of fill out that almost higher mid range. I know their band pass to be like sort of lower, but the sounds are so like high end heavy that even band passing it like this, there's still a lot coming through in like this range just above it. And then for transitions, we have this guy here which is my approximation of this sort of cloudy synth that comes in for specific transitions in the song. My way of coming up with a sound like this is to just find like a really clean synth. Just sort of play something random and high, staying mainly on the primary intervals of whatever key you're playing in. So for this one, we were in B flat major. So I'm just kind of pedaling on the root, the major third and the fifth, and then a little bit of the fifth, the octave below. EQ to sort of band pass it, really limiting it to, again, that sort of middle mid-range frequency with a little bit of ping pong delay just to sort of turn it into more of like a cascading feel and then run it through some reverb effects on the sense. So it doesn't really feel like a lead line where you're like playing notes. It just kind of feels like a roll into something. And it just does that little sprinkle of reverby goodness near the end of every progression. Another element that kind of helps out with those transitions is this very old piano sound which I got from using the Maverick from Native Instruments on their Dirty Old Grand preset. But it wasn't as like out of tune feeling as I wanted it to be. So I actually added some chorus on top of that. Cut out some of the lows because the Native Instruments stuff, at least from my mixing style, tends to be pretty low end heavy. And then ran it into some compression. 
and some reverb on the tail end. Next, we go to the drums, which start out with this sort of main beat here. Again, these like very sparse, simple elements that have like kind of weird sound design choices. But like when I play all of them together, like here, if I just play the drums with uh, all the synths that I've shown you so far. Like that is the opening to the song. And it's interesting how dense and organic it can feel with these like super electronic elements. It's also got this like fun, like almost folk beat playing on these electronic samples, which again sort of adds to that sort of indie vibe. For the actual drums, I got this uh, reverb machine drum rack. It's sort of based off of a Lin drum machine. And then I just use the, uh, the kick and the snare to try to get the sound that I was looking for. Mainly, I had to mess around with the snare a lot because there was a lot of transient shaping and erosion and chiptune filter stuff to try to make it sound weird like that original sample. And when we get to the chorus, that same beat is playing, but it switches up a little bit. So the kick gets a little heavier, so I swap to this different sample here which is more of like an EDM sample, but still with not as harsh of a click to it. it, just gives a little bit of low end to everything. We still have that same snare hit happening, but I lower the volume a little bit. And then we layer in the brushes. Again, I used a bunch of weird sound design stuff with this guy, so I rendered it out as audio here, but I left the instruments so I could show you guys. We just have a little bit of gate going to clamp down on the room noise, the transient shaping, a little bit of erosion and redux, actually a lot of redux, because I felt like that brush sound in the original track, it's very much like harsh and clippy and digital and weird, but it just kind of works, honestly. And then after that, I did some more erosion and transient shaping, sort of bring out that attack and then recently i've been messing around with kramer pie a lot as like a drum compressor i used to use this guy a lot when i was making like rock music and i forgot how much i loved it as just like a really over the top compressor but the result is this giant drum brush thing that kind of matches that dun 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 synth but sort of adds that folky sort of boosting of energy for the track underneath that we have a little bit of shaker just to sort of accentuate that feeling a little bit more. Instead of a crash, I feel like for tracks like this, it actually works a lot better to do something like an exhale. So I grabbed this sample here and then just drowned it in reverb. And this is such an effective transition or crash replacement that most of the times, whenever I'm doing a track like this for a client, I will literally use my SM7B and track an exhale from me. Like I will actually go, and record that over the track like three times and I'll like comp my best takes and process them like this exhale because I feel like that sort of wash of somebody breathing out it works really well as pseudo cymbal swell I don't know I love doing stuff like this and I've been doing it for a long time after we go through the drums we have our basses which is split into two parts we have this first part here which is the main bass and like the verse I just used a very simple mini Moog on this uh, fretless bass preset because I felt like in the original track, it was like a synth bass, but it was almost made to sound like a live bass. Either that or they just played it live and they have an insane amount of sustain on that bass patch. Because when we're playing those notes, normally with the live bass, you'll see sort of like a volume drop off as it goes throughout the note. Whereas with a synth bass where you have the sustain up a bit, it'll actually hold the note consistently and it won't like slow slowly duck in volume the way that a live bass would. And then when we get to the chorus, we have the same bass playing an octave lower, sort of doubling it, really giving us that beef. I'll show you the transition between the two of them. So this is by itself and then into the chorus, both of them play. Just a little bit more of a thickness to it. Another part of that sound is I'm using FabFilter Saturn and I'm really driving sort of like the upper range of it separately from the low end and then blending that in a bit. I find that this is helpful for blending two basses together and keeping them from sounding like two separate instruments. But yeah, get a sort of rounder saturation for the low end and then get a very harsh-ish version of that for the upper mids and high end and then just sort of blend it in. And now that we've gone through all of that let's look at the guitars which start out with some very light acoustics
I felt like one of the characteristics of these guys that I tried to replicate in the performance was even though I was holding like the full G shaped chord on the acoustic, the one that everybody learns, I really only played like the middle strings a little bit and just lightly strummed it with my thumb because I felt like it needed to still be delicate. And if you strum the full chord with like a pick, it really makes it feel like it's supposed to be a guitar focused part. But I feel like this part is meant to be a supporting part for those synths with just a little bit of rhythm added. So I just sort of lightly pedaled it with my thumb, which is a great way to get that sort of like calm, folky vibe. Underneath that, we have some plucked electrics that come in during the chorus. Again, these are almost meant to accentuate that sort of chiptune pluck feel. I used my 335 for these guys because I wanted something that was a bit darker that had a little bit of beef behind it. Also, I recently got uh, the Imperial Tone King from Neural DSP, and I've been a big fan of it. I think it's great for these sort of run of the mill guitar tones where you just need something solid. Underneath that, we have more of an actual lead line that goes through transition points. Again, just super sparse stuff to sort of lead into that next bar, but not drawing attention to itself that much. And then underneath that, we have a very light pedaling finger style guitar that's on a bit more of a clean patch. Just adds a little bit of sparkle on the top of the song. Also, when you're using something like a 335 on the neck pickup on a patch like this, it really fills out that like woofy side of the mid range without being overbearing. Here's all of the guitar layers together. Like there's just enough chord information in there to tie it with the rest of the song, but it is pretty like sparse. And the last thing to look at are these strings. Not really doing anything crazy. Cellos are doing a root and a fifth. Violas are sort of holding out a pad, pedaling on the upper notes. And then violins are kind of doing a higher melody. I think the strings are a large part of why the track feels so organic and has that human feel, even though there's a bunch of weird sound design stuff at the beginning of it. Because at the very beginning of the track, when the strings come in, they're sort of filtered down, but then they sort of open up a bit when they get to the chorus. So in the verses, they have this sort of like dense mid range that they're adding to everything in this warmth and they sort of softly let go into something that's a little bit more brightness and airy so here let me show you verse into the chorus it's just a subtle bit of automation but when you take that sort of gentle high-end lift in a tasteful way and then you multiply that by multiple tracks in your instrumental doing that it really does a lot to make the song feel like it's lifting up to something bigger without adding something super drastic which for this song it's more of an indie folk song so it's perfect for that i really did not care about keeping audio fidelity super clean so uh, i'm doing a lot of processing on the master bus some Kramer tape just to give it that sort of general tape shape. I'm doing this thing with FabFilter Saturn that I used to do a lot on my mastering chains when I was doing a bunch of like rock stuff. Basically, you separate everything into three bands, your lows, your mids, and your highs, and you turn off your lows and your highs and just leave the mids and just make them sound real nasty. And then you bump and then you balance out the level with it, and then you can mix it in a certain percentage here, and it just sort of gives that sort of mid-range bite to it. I learned this one on a Creative Live class with uh, Jesse Cannon, I think. And then a little bit of RC20, because it's not indie pop unless there's RC20 on the master. And I think that is everything, so let's look at the final instrumental.
So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. If you guys have any other Gracie Abrams songs you would like me to take a look at, put them in the comments down below. Again, I do one of these videos every Friday. So if you enjoyed this, hit subscribe, bell icon, all that stuff below. And yeah, I will see you guys next week.